Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chandra is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE partnership webinar, which is titled Personal Care Product Use and Chemical Exposure Among Black, Latina, and Vietnamese Women in California, Findings from the Capable Project. Our moderator today is Cheryl Patton, Director of Commonweal's Biomonitoring Resource Center. We will leave time following the speaker's presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any page during the presentation. For those of you who have called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speaker. This webinar is scheduled to last for 45 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Cheryl. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you very much for everyone for joining in. So we're gonna talk about personal care products today, uh, which many of us use on a regular basis. And really personal care products may be a delivery system or toxic chemicals. When we apply them, we might be inhaling, absorbing, ingesting these chemicals, which may be uh, ingredients for some personal care products. Some of them may be endocrine disrupting chemicals, some may be even carcinogens. Capable, and I'm gonna read the name of what that capable stands for, the Chemicals and Personal Care Asian Black and Latina Exposure Project is a diverse coalition of community health organizations and scientists who are executing a multi-pronged approach to study racial and ethnic differences of personal care products use and chemical exposures. Expo understanding these differences may explain some of the differences in, in elevated risk for diseases that have been related to toxic chemical exposures among these different populations. Now, we're really pleased to uh, have uh, Paula Johnson with us today. She's chief of the California Safe Cosmetics Program at the California Department of Public Health. Her expertise includes exposure and epidemiological research on chemicals and consumer products and methods for synthesizing streams of evidence of toxicity. She's had 10 years of experience in product development analysis for manufacturing industries. She holds a PhD in environmental health sciences from the University of Michigan and a master's degree in public health from San Diego State University. She was a research fellow with the University of California, San Francisco's program on reproductive health and environment, PRE, which many of us are very familiar with. And there she helped develop the very first systematic review methodology for environmental health. So Paula, so please you're here with us today and please take over. All right, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. I appreciate you setting up the topic for today too. Um, greetings, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to share this work with you today. Um, I'll start off by explaining who we are. Um, we call it the Capable Study, Chemicals and Personal Care, Asian, Black, and Latina Exposure. And our aims were to build a diverse community research collaborative, examine patterns of personal care product use among Asian and Black women and Latinas, Asian is specifically Vietnamese in this case. Um, and we aimed to identify chemicals of relevance to breast cancer toxicity and products used by these women. And also to empower communities to do something to protect themselves from hazardous exposures. And so this slide shows who the partners are in this collaboration and where they are based across California. I'm at the California Department of Public Health and Kim Harley is at UC Berkeley's Center for Environmental Research and Children's Health. And moving down the map, Chamacos um, is an organization working with Clinica de Salud in California's Central Valley, Salinas, serving Latino farm worker communities. And the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative serves a Vietnamese immigrant workforce in the Los Angeles area and also the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and Healthy Heritage works with black communities of the Inland Empire region of Southern California. And um, we had a co-PI from each of these organizations in the Capable Project. So why cosmetics and why women of color? 
So first, cosmetics or personal care products are not regulated the same as most other products we use in the United States. Very few ingredients are banned for use in cosmetics and no pre-market safety testing is required. And not a whole lot is known about how cosmetics affect women's health and even less is known by race or ethnicity. While we know that some products have targeted marketing to women of color and they may use more products. There are well-established racial disparities in health outcomes such as breast cancer. For example, the US Center for Disease Control data indicate that black women have a higher rate of premenopausal breast cancer and more aggressive types of cancer and are 40% more likely to die of breast cancer than white women. So there can be some misconceptions about the FDA's authority or assumptions that anything that is sold in stores must be safe to use, but that's not necessarily the case. The FDA does not have very strong regulatory authority over cosmetics in the same way they do for food or drugs, and they can't require product recalls or certain safety tests before a product goes on the market. And so over the past few years, more evidence has been emerging about these exposures and the potential disparities. Um, several groups of chemicals used in personal care products have been linked with breast cancer susceptibility or upstream health effects such as endocrine disruption and early puberty. Higher product use has been associated with higher levels of these chemicals in people's bodies and there are racial or ethnic differences in the body burdens of these chemicals. There's growing evidence that differences in product use contributes to disparate exposure and health, particularly among African-Americans. For example, higher use of intimate care products was associated with higher exposure to diethyl phthalate and hair dye and relaxer or straightener use has been associated with incidence of breast cancer. So in our study, there were four main components. Um, we, had a, we conducted a survey on product selection and use in each of our represented three communities. Uh, we inventoried stores, of products for products marketed to or used by women in each community. And we conducted an analysis of ingredient labels of many products. And then finally, um, a lab analysis of a subset of those products. And um, for the survey, our community partners conducted the survey. Uh, we surveyed 321 women and it focused on the frequency of use for six different product categories, including hair, skin, makeup, nail, deodorant or perfumes, and intimate care products. And it focused on where women shop and factors that affect how they choose products. Mm. Uh, this, the pie chart here shows the demographics of the survey. We had four racial ethnic groups, plus some women identifying as mixed race. These groups differed on several characteristics. Um, most Vietnamese and almost half of Latina women were born outside of the US and most of black and white women were US born and white women had the highest income in education and Vietnamese the lowest. Um, and then black women were slightly older on average. So I'm just gonna get into some of the survey results. Um, um, some of the specific survey findings here. Um, I encourage you to see our paper on the survey results because we looked at um, about 45 different product types and it's just too much to share with you during this pre presentation. But um, if you um, look at our, our look up our paper on the survey results, you'll find much more detail there on the patterns across the various um, different product types and <clears throat> race and ethnicity groups. <clears throat> so this table is an example of the frequency of use of just several intimate care products, wipes, wash, or cleansers, um, fragrance sprays, and douches. 
So first we use regression models to get the age and education adjusted percent of women using these products at least once per month and then conducted pairwise comparisons between each racial and ethnic group. So in general, use of these products was most common in black women and Latinas as indicated by the higher percentages using those products. And Latinas had significantly higher use of the intimate care wipes than all the other groups. Now I'll move on to um, nail products. Um, this is showing the percent of women reporting use of certain nail products at least once per year by race and ethnicity. Um, this shows that black, Latina and Vietnamese women use gel polish significantly more than the white women in our survey. Um, and black and Latinas, black women and Latinas used two types of artificial nails. That's the UV nail builder and acrylic nails most frequently. Um, the use of regular nail polish and remover did not differ among groups um, and is not included here. Okay, so as I mentioned, we looked at a lot of different product types and I just want to briefly summarize some other highlights of the interesting findings of the survey. Um, black women used professional hair services most frequently such as hair relaxing and extensions or weaves, although hair dyeing was less common among black women. Vietnamese women used facial cleansers and leave-in hair conditioners most often. Latina women used makeup um, such as a mascara and lipstick um, more, most frequently. They used acrylic nails most frequently and dyed their hair at home most frequently. And all groups had high use of nail polish, about 80%. White women didn't use any product significantly most frequently among these women. And interesting, to point out too is um, that most women from all the races and ethnicities reported choosing products based on what works well for them. Um, but also most black women said they choose products that were made for my race or labeled as natural, um, which I'll point out that labeling of natural doesn't really mean anything because there's no legal definition of that. And a lot of products tend to use that word natural. Um, and then also most Vietnamese women said they choose products that were the right price. Okay, so we found that women are also concerned about chemicals in their products. Overall, almost a third of women try to avoid certain products when uh, avoid, avoid certain ingredients when choosing products. And that was um, a bit higher for black and uh, white women, 40 to 50%. We asked which ingredients specifically in the survey, but only a few women wrote in what they avoid. And um, some of those are listed here, parabens, phthalates, aluminum, perfumes, fragrance, and sulfates. Most women said they would choose a fragrance-free option of their products if it was available. All right, so now I'm gonna describe the store inventories that we did next. Um, for the store inventories, the community partners visited 39 different stores across the three communities. And they documented products by photographs, focusing on what is marketed to them. And um, they photographed a range, or I mean, sorry, they, they visited a range of larger chain stores or drug stores, beauty supply stores, and small specialty stores. <clears throat> These stores were representative of where women who took our survey shopped. And we originally aimed to visit a greater number of stores, but we were interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. But um, we did find that we were a still able to document several thousand products and uh, we decided that was a practical amount to deal with. And this, this effort was largely to inform the product selection for reviewing ingredient labels. 
And our community partners also chose which products to review the labels for. And this was informed by survey results that told us which product types to focus on and um, the frequency of specific products in the stores we visit, visited. And then also the community partners knowledge of common use of those products. And we reviewed product ingredient labels online for efficiency aided by an Excel-based macro we developed to quickly identify known chemicals of concern by comparing the product ingredient lists to the authoritative lists of chemicals of concern. And we ended up completing 546 product label reviews. So we identified chemicals of concern that were carcinogens, developmental or reproductive toxicants, or endocrine disruptors. We also recorded instances of fragrance or parfum listed at, in ingredient labels because it indicates additional ingredients added to a product, but not disclosed on the label. So we defined chemicals of concern as those appearing on these lists of chemicals, carcinogens and developmental and reproductive toxicants identified by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the U.S. National Toxicology Program, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and California OEHA, also known in California as Prop 65 chemicals. Um, and then we defined endocrine disruptors as those identified by the TEDx organization. And because this list is inclusive of chemicals with limited evidence, we also considered evaluation by the European Chemicals Agency as a means to raise the level of concern for those chemicals. Okay, so for the label review, we looked at six different product categories, which were the same as our survey, hair, skin, makeup, nail, deodorants or perfumes, and intimate care products. Um, although there were a greater number of hair and skin products that, that the community partners chose for the label review. Among all products, over half had chemicals of concern on the ingredient labels, and 74% had undisclosed fragrance ingredients. It was slightly higher numbers for uh, with chemicals of concern with fragrance and with fragrance chemicals for products used by Black women compared to overall findings and slightly lower numbers for products used by Vietnamese women compared to overall findings. And so these were the chemicals of most concern that we identified on product labels. That is known or potential carcinogens, developmental or reproductive toxicants, or potential endocrine disruptors with a higher level of concern supported by evidence from the European Chemicals Agency. This graph shows percent frequency among 546 ingredient labels of chemicals um, or groups of chemicals according to products selected by the different community partners. So we see that the most frequent chemicals are formaldehyde re releasers, cyclosiloxanes, parabens, butylated hydroxytoluene or BHT, and lilial. The different product categories generally followed, a, um, these are, so these are the overall this, um, trends for all the products, but the general product categories followed a similar trend with similar chemicals appearing on those labels as well. Okay, so now I'll move into the lab analysis part. We sent a subset of products, uh, 31 different products for lab analysis to screen for additional chemicals of concern not identified on product labels. Um, the lab used two-dimensional gas chromatography and time-of-flight mass spectrometry for a hybrid targeted non-targeted approach. That is, we screened for the presence of a large number of chemicals and also quantified a smaller number of target chemicals such as phthalates. And so there were a total of 27 chemicals of concern detected in the 31 products, not including those detected only in trace levels, which are not shown in this graph, um, which include dibutyl phthalate and diisobutyl phthalate. But so the bar colors here indicate what type of chemical it is. Most of them are fragrance ingredients, 
that is used to give scent or mask odor. Those are the green bars. Uh, some are typically used as preservatives, solvents, or ultraviolet, ultraviolet light blocking agents. Um, but all of these are likely components of the fragrance mixture added to the product, especially if they are not listed on the ingredient label. Um, benzyl chloride and 1,4-dioxane are typically unintended, unintended contaminants, which is a concern because they are carcinogens. So for example, 1,4-dioxane was measured in three different product types, a shampoo, a moisturizer, and an intimate wash. Um, as far as labeling, uh, six of these chemicals were sometimes on labels. That was methylparaben, benzoic acid, lilial, BHT, octal methoxycinnamate, and homosalate. One chemical was always on the product labels, and that was ethylparaben, a preservative. And, but all the others, 20 of these chemicals were never, on, never disclosed on the product labels. Okay, so this, these are, um, when looking specifically at what's on the label versus not on the label, we generally see more chemicals of concern that are not disclosed on product labels, illustrating the lack of transparency of what's in the product. Um, so the numbers one through 31 across the bottom of the graph, the x-axis represent the 31 different products tested. And the y-axis counts the number of chemicals of concern in each product. Of all these detections of chemicals of concern, about 74%, or that's represented by the orange bars, are not disclosed on the labels. So what do we do with these findings, right? Um, part of our collaboration is about empowering communities to make informed choices. And we worked together to create easy messaging about this. Um, we recognize that there's no one perfect message to give back to communities, but to address the concerns of the communities that we worked with, these were the main messages that we came up with. And um, if nothing else, to look for products that are fragrance-free or paraben-free, and you could probably avoid most of the chemicals that we found on the products that we reviewed. And they don't have to memorize complicated chemical names. Um, also possibly using fewer products or using online tools to help select products. And one of the, th one of the things that our partners felt strongly about was including a call to action as they understand that policy is also very important. So some of the limitations of our study, um, it was conducted in specific communities of California. And so we may not be able to generalize to all Latinas, Black and Vietnamese women. Um, there were also limited numbers of stores and limited numbers of products reviewed and tested. Uh, we relied on online ingredients for the label review. So there is a chance that some products and stores differed from what was represented online. Um, we also did not examine any products of brands that are sold online only, but our prior community survey suggested that the women in these communities primarily shopped in stores represented in our store inventories. Um, and then also a limitation was that the different communities chose different product types to review, limited, which limited our available, um, limited our ability to draw conclusions based on racial or ethnic differences and chemicals within the same product type. We also did not review a group of products that were mainstream or specifically not marketed to women of color. And then the lab method was limited to chemicals that can be analyzed by gas chromatography and could, not, could underestimate the number of chemicals of concern. For example, um, our, the lab method we used would not find heavy metal contaminants. Ooh. 
So as I mentioned, policy change is another way to address chemicals of concern in cosmetics. And California is leading the way in the US on this with laws about consumer right to know ingredients and even ingredient bans starting in 2025. Um, there's also new federal legislation that has been proposed that builds upon the California laws. And I want to highlight this new law in particular because my program recently implemented it. The Cosmetic Fragrance and Flavor Ingredient Right to Know Act of 2020, or CAFERCA, we call it for short. Uh, CAFERCA expands the list of ingredients that cosmetics companies must report to our state program. Carcinogens and developmental or reproductive toxicants have been reportable since 2005 in the state of California. And the new law commenced in January of this year and requires reporting of fragrance and flavor cosmetic ingredients linked to an expanded list of health effects, including endocrine disruptors, neurotoxicants, allergens, and persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals. And we have to make this information available to the public in an online database. And so um, before I conclude, I just want to give you a snapshot of reporting under the new law. Um, it's very interesting to see this, um, the reports is, you know, coming in since the beginning of this year, and it's a growing number. Um, it's, um, companies are reporting on a continual basis. It commenced in January, as I said, and so far, so far we've seen 97 newly reported ingredients. And these are some of the most frequently reported ingredients so far on this slide. Uh, fragrance, allergens, thousands of products already. These are ingredients such as linalool, geraniol, eugenol, um, things that are added to um, scent or mask odors and products. They're very common um, and they are mostly a concern for people with fragrance allergies. Um, and then Lilial is, is also a, a very frequently reported ingredient. It's a reproductive toxicant um, banned in the EU. It's also a, a fragrance, synthetic fragrance ingredient. Um, and we have over 1000 products reported so far containing Lilial. Um, and then cyclosiloxanes, phthalates, and parabens, which we saw frequently in the capable study, are also some of the top ingredients reported now. Okay, so in conclusion, simply put, there are a lot of chemicals of concern in personal care products, and we found high numbers in the products marketed to or used by women in our partner communities. And we found generally more chemicals of concern that were not disclosed on ingredient labels. And practical tips can be given in simple messaging, like go fragrance free, but it can be hard to shop our way out of hazardous exposures and policy changes can be helpful too. And there are online tools to help avoid certain ingredients and make more informed choices, including our state database, and there's a link here to that. And there are other great tools out there too, like this web browser called Clearia that alerts consumers to hazards while shopping online. Uh, so thank you, that's um, all I have today. And I just particularly want to acknowledge our community partners um, and all the, the research partners and staff that are listed here, um, uh, the names in bold are the co-PIs for the Capable Project. And I have to say that the community partners were amazing, especially because they somehow remained committed to this project during the COVID pandemic while they had much more urgent things to deal with, with within their uh, organizations and those communities. And uh, I just wanna say thank you. And um, that's all, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that really brilliant presentation and the great work you do. It's, it's quite um, stunning how much you've managed to do. And uh, 
the quality of the work is also outstanding. I have a couple of questions just to start. And one is, what, what kind of follow-up are you able to do with the communities who participated to see whether there's been a, a decrease in the use of some products and possibly an increase in the use of other kinds of products? And, and how are you kind of sustaining the interest in the groups you worked with to get this information out? I think that's a great question. Um, but what we know is just anecdotal right now. You know, a lot of people that are, um, I mean, hearing from our community partners saying that people report to them that they will select products that are fragrance-free, for example, or uh, try to avoid um, parabens. But I think that that's a good setup to a, a the next project follow up on this to to really try to evaluate that use and if um, as an intervention. Yeah, well, that's that's great to know. I'm just thinking of the different groups uh, across the state that might you might go to do a, a similar presentation or have a uh, a member of that organization find a way to distribute this information because it's so important for people to understand this. Um, I'm wondering whether some choices might be determined because people don't have access to what is apparently greener personal care products because their shopping sources are basically uh, dollar stores, which are not great uh, in terms of uh, uh, selling toxic chemical free products. Would that play into this at all? Just the access to where they might be able to buy products that are green? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I mean, some of the stores that we were finding on our um, um, that were, were reported in our survey were dollar stores that was reported several times. Um, dollar General, dollar store, um, and then like swap meets in the Latina community, um, and you know, like. We know that some of these big change, like um, for example, Whole Foods is a good example where they have, and, and even Walmart and Target now are, are coming up with some of their own policies because they're being proactive since there's no federal legislation um, about this, federal laws that you know require the FDA to do anything or to monitor the different kinds of ingredients. Um, a chains like Walmart and Target and Whole Foods are ha they have their own in-house um, standards that they, for example, won't sell products that are unless they're phthalate free. Um, and so there's definitely some differences among retailers, for sure. Interesting, isn't it? Hmm. You know, I'm thinking, of course, about many of these companies are international and getting this information out to more to an international audience because women's groups across uh, the Globe you know, also use a lot of personal care products and they like to buy them often from uh, the big corporations that sell also to the United States. It'd be interesting to find a way to reach out. I mean, I wish we were doing this uh, webinar or with some simultaneous translation into some languages so other women could learn more about it. I just think this is so important. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious that, that no PFAS were found in any of the, uh, as one of the ingredients in, uh, they, they may not be a direct ingredient, but they might be part of the packaging. Uh, was that not tested for? Well, we didn't test that in the, um, the laboratory tests of the 31 products, but I also was a little bit surprised that we didn't see any PFAS um, ingredients on any of the product labels, particularly of the makeup products that we reviewed. Um, it, it could be that, um, they aren't labeled, they aren't disclosed. It could be that um, they are hidden because they're, they're identified by different names that um, are not on authoritative lists, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure why that was. It's kind of curious, isn't it? Okay, we've got, I'm, I realize I'm monopolizing all the questions, which is not very polite. We've got some good questions here. Um, uh, do certain brands contain more chemicals of a concern listed or not than others? Or uh, uh, country of manufacture, is that a determinant in terms of how many toxic chemicals there might be in, in a product? Do certain, yeah. Did I say well, that? you know, the, the, the easy answer is no, not necessarily. Um, 
because you know, for instance, European products, um, they are, they have much more stringent laws in Europe for, for what goes into personal care products. So um, you might find fewer ingredients in European products, but, you know, when they're sold here, you know, you, you don't know for sure. Um, but, you know, other, other products um, coming in from other countries, it depends on the country, you know, that I, I know like, for example, um, a good example is um, skin lighteners containing mercury coming in from Mexico or some Asian countries. Um, but as far as like the kind of analysis that we did in the capable study, um, you know, as you can see, like even products that are sold in the United States and it's legal to add these ingredients like that are carcinogenic. So it, it's um, not necessarily that, that, you know, it's not easy to choose products that would not have these kind of ingredients in, that, in them unless you're specifically looking for products that are labeled paraben free or phthalate free. If they label something like that, it, that is legally binding. And so they shouldn't actually contain parabens or phthalates. Um, but, you know, it's hard to really, re um, you know, memorize a list of chemicals. And so that's why we encourage the use of some of the online tools or just, you know, looking for specific statements like paraben free or fragrance free. Hmm. Okay. And, uh, how, how did community members respond when learning about these findings? Were they generally overwhelmed by the data or were they inspired to take action such as individual changes in product use or becoming involved in policy advocacy? Um, right now, we don't have a measure of, you know, increased involvement in advocacy. Um, that would be a great next step to this project. Um, but um, sorry, what was the first part of the question again before the advocacy? Oh, uh, how do they respond? When they oh, right. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it can be overwhelming, but I think that, you know, that's why we were um, um, trying to develop that messaging to be really simple, like focus on one or two things that, that people can do. And that was what our community partners, um, the, they said that that was, that was important to do, to, to really kind of simplify it and, and not overwhelm people, not have, like if we're presenting to different audiences, we, we might not, we didn't show like a long list of chemicals because that was overwhelming. We had, we just um, told them that we found like this, like the number of chemicals you know, or present the simple messaging, like some of, the, some of the messaging that I shared with you today, like over half of the products that we looked at contained chemicals of concern. And we don't have to get into what all of those were because that gets overwhelming, but just to, to, to pay attention to that so that they, they, know, they know that finding that, uh, that there's a lot of products out there, mainstream products that that have chemicals of concern and then just something simple to look for. Mm, no, that's a, that was a really wise decision. I think it could be really overwhelming. Um, do you have any way of tracking how frequently the online database of ingredients is, is used? Um, assuming that you mean our, our state database, um, mm -hmm. um, I don't have the information for you to share with you today, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We're working on it though. Okay, and can you talk about the impact of the Safe Cosmetics database on manufacturers? Are you getting uh, comments from manufacturers or sense of companies are reformulating to eliminate chemicals of concern when they realize their products are listed on the database? Um, you know, there's, there's evidence of ingredients being phased out and um, I think that there's a number of different um, factors that might contribute to that. For example, ingredients like phthalates and ingredients like um, cocomide DEA in, in shampoo that's, um, that's a carcinogen. 
Um, and I think, you know, I can't claim that it's 100% because they had to disclose it on our database because, you know, there's also Prop 65 laws and, um, and that there's also a lot of great nonprofit organizations that are doing work in this area and bringing these issues to light and putting pressure on the industry to make changes. Um, so we can just claim to be part of that larger change. Okay, and uh, I'm not, let's see, some of, everyone's saying great study and presentation, just so you know that on the, the Q&A piece. Thanks so much. <laughs> can, can you share a link to any community-facing educational mater materials that were developed? Do you have a place where people can go and look at your, your posters and your fact sheets and things like that? Yes, um, we were able to make a capable study page on our um, uh, Department of Public Health website for the Safe Cosmetics Program. And the link to that is... Um, I just shared it in the chat for everyone. You did? Okay. I'm, I'm looking for that link. It's somewhere in there. It's also on our webpage too, in our resources okay. as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think this, this is about all the questions we have. And, and so I think I'll, <clears throat> if, if there's no other comments that you want to share at this point or where you're going next in your research, that would be useful, I think. And then we'll hand it back to Hannah. Okay, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I gave you my email address and I'm happy to, um, you know, listen to more questions and, and get back to people at a later date in happy to um, have people reach out to me and uh, with interest in this work. Thanks oh. again. Okay, thanks, Paul. It was terrific. Thank you very, very much. Okay, Hannah, can you close thanks. this out? Yeah, thank you so much, Paula, for um, introducing your work to our audience. And thank you, Cheryl, for moderating. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Shay's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Shea EDC Strategies Partnership webinar will take place on May 19th and is titled Obesogens and the Obesity Pandemic, a focus on prevention. To learn more and RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to Che and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign on up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these Che web partnership webinars bringing the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support Che's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speaker, Paula, for taking time to present today and to you, Cheryl, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. We're wishing all much health and wellness. Stay well.